Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's a terrific honour to be asked to participate in this event. I'm actually a leftover item from a previous version of the program. It, uh, the program, all of this comes from Jeff Miller. It's his inspiration. He was in Jakarta in the embassy as these events took uh, place. Uh, the embassy not knowing at all what was going on, but uh, very interested to find out. And it was his idea to uh, stage this conference 50 years later to try and find out what they didn't know at the time. So there were, at that time there weren't many speakers and I said, well, I could do a little bit of sort of setting the scene, of explaining, but then all these other speakers of substance and gravitas were added to it and I suggested that I should be allowed to slink quietly into the shadows, <laughs> but I was kept on as an act of kindness to a, an aging dinosaur rapidly approaching extinction. And I see here that on the program, my university is the University of New South Wales with an H, W-H-A-L-E-S. Thank you very much. It shows they had large, uh, warm-blooded mammals in mind when they were thinking of me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I, I, I should probably spin out my introductory remarks because Gareth Evans has stolen all the things I was going to say in my, inter, my introduction to the main uh, eight theories of the coup. So uh, he outlined the events of that day and I, what I want to do is just outline before Robert Cribb speaks about conspiracies, the eight versions of uh, who was behind what happened on that day. There were two very important event, uh, dates, the 4th of August and the 5th of October. The 4th of August was the date on which Sukarno vomited and collapsed. President Sukarno vomited and collapsed after, uh, while meeting the chairman of the Golkar Party. Now, I've written a book about the Golkar Party, and I could see how you might well uh, vomit and collapse at a meeting such as that, but uh, this is with some hindsight. The important thing was that the president's mortality was brought very much into play. It was then feared that Sukarno might suddenly die, and then that, if so, that might kick off what everybody felt was going to be a confrontation between the left, led by the PKI, and a large uh, right bloc led by the leaders of the army. So the 4th of August is very important there as setting the stage of Sukarno's de death being imagined as quite possibly happening in, in the very, uh, very short period, causing everybody who was no doubt probably making plans anyway what to do about it to advance those plans and perhaps to slip over from thinking defensively into taking action that would uh, uh, change events in their direction. The other very important date was the 5th of October, because that's Armed Forces Day, and troops were being brought into the capital to uh, celebrate Armed Forces Day, and what people on the left feared, and there were many rumours, Jakarta was full of rumours apparently in these times, 64 and 65, a time of very great political tension, flowing, ebbing, but a very great tension in parts of 64 and 65. And so the Armed Forces Day, the 5th of October, was seen as the day on which a group of disloyal generals, perhaps, perhaps acting at the behest of the CIA, might stage a coup to, uh, to overthrow Sukarno, to install a right-wing uh, rule, so that the, the, the spectre of this date, the 5th of October, uh, was one which led what plotters there were to think that they had to act before them. So then when you look at the uh, theories of who was behind it, as Gareth Evans said, the PKI was the Dalang, is the major theory in Indonesia. It's still taught, I believe, in schools today that the party was responsible and the essential facts of anyone who argues that the PKI did it 
lies with the figure of Sham, Shamsuddin Kamaruzaman, the head of the PKI's special bureau. So Sham's role was to control, manipulate, activate and move the plotters in the army who actually carried out the capture of the generals on the day. So there were confessions at various of the trials. It's very difficult to know what weight, if any, should be given to the different trials that took place in 1966, 1967, 1968. But in Shum's trial, he endorsed this version. So probably the Eidit confession was a fake. Uh, Yonu retracted his confession at his trial. But Shum actually said that as head of the PKI Special Bureau, he took orders from Eidit to get the plotters in the army to take the action. So that's what the version comes down to. I don't, it's not very much accepted in the West, I think, but uh, it is until today the major version of events that has currency in Indonesia, that the PKI did it through the activities of Sham, the head of the Special Bureau, manipulating people in the army at the order of Dien Aydit. The second version, as you know, is the version that came out of the Cornell paper, written by, mainly by Ben Anderson and Ruth McVeigh and Fred Bunnell, which was written soon after the event. And its import was to show that you didn't need to implicate the PKI at all, that there were sufficient reasons, sufficient uh, discontent amongst the central central Javanese officers who carried out the kidnappings, there were sufficient reasons for them to act against what they saw as their own disloyal generals. You didn't need to use the PKI uh, to explain what happened on the day. So this is the theory mainly known as the internal army affair. And it also argued that the PKI was doing well enough by the peaceful road. Now, that couldn't be argued. It hadn't actually got any really senior positions. But if it seems that the PKI was going OK uh, by becoming the biggest, most uh, active supporter of Sukarno and gaining Sukarno's favor, why would it risk as if they did, they certainly brought their followers to absolute uh, disaster. Why would the leaders of a party that was doing well risk the adventurism of involvement uh, in a coup that could go wrong and did go so terribly wrong and bring the party to disaster? So that was the internal army affair. It's based with different versions uh, as time has gone by with the, on the uh, paper that came out of Cornell. Initially a discussion paper, an internal paper, but leaked and later published. The third theory is that who was, would have benefited if the coup had worked properly? And that uh, the Sakano as Dalang is the third theory. And this largely depends on the testimony of one of uh, Sukarno's adjutants, military aides, Colonel Bambang Wijanarko. And so there's all these different testimonies that you've got to weigh up. It was generally believed in the military that Sukarno was implicated. And Nasutian said in 1967, the president gave the coup his blessing and assistance. So that comes from a source as important as Nasutian. It was the testimony of Bambang Wijanarko that he saw the president get a letter from Colonel Untung on the night of the 30th of September advising that the coup was about to take place later that evening and that Sukarno read the letter, indicated his assent uh, that the coup should go ahead and then uh, Sukarno gave a very... Uh, motivating speech about the Wayang and the figure of Arjuna having to do his duty even though duty was hard and so on. 
So we can say various things about what Sukarno did after the events themselves, but it's this testimony from Bambang Wijanarko that Sukarno got a letter saying the coup was going ahead and that Sukarno indicated his assent that the event should go ahead. So then there is the Sahato as the Dalang theme, I think the idea that Sukarno as the Dalang has receded over time. And now there's more of the picture of Sukarno being a victim of these events and pushed unfairly from power. And the idea of Sahato as the Dalang has gained increasing acceptance as a at least a, a possibility, a strong possibility. And this comes down, as Gareth Evans meant, uh, mentioned mainly to the testimony of Colonel Abdul Latif, who says that he met Sakano, uh, Sahato, I'm sorry, Sahato, on the night in, at a hospital visit and days before to tell Sahato what was happening. So Sahato knew the if this testimony is reliable, Sahato knew what events were taking place and he allowed them to happen, if not encouraged them. Apparently, according to Greg Pulgrain's article in Inside Indonesia, you interviewed Latif, didn't you, Greg? Uh, Greg, uh, the, one of the puzzles of the coup is why Sahato's name wasn't on the list of the people to be kidnapped and when the troops that were going to do the kidnapping asked, why isn't Sahato's name on the list? Uh, they were told, because he is one of us. So he was, Sukarno might have been the beneficiary if it had all worked out. Sahato was the beneficiary as it all worked out. And various scholars, Vertheim, Benedict Anderson, Greg Pulgrain, are of the opinion that Sahato was strongly implicated as the major planner or as someone who let it go ahead to take what benefit he could from it as it occurred. But uh, the, Sahato's role, I think, is probably more strongly felt to be a possibility than Sakano's in the current state of academic writing. We must also mention the CIA as the Dalang. It was described as the coup that was made in the USA. Uh, the events were clearly teetering, rushing towards some sort of resolution. Probably intelligence services would have been negligent if they weren't trying to shape uh, events. Uh, Sukarno several times talked about the role of the CIA in these events, but it's objected that uh, if the CIA couldn't get rid of Castro, only a few miles from their coast, how were they going to get rid of Sakano in this immensely complicated country, much more complicated country, so far away? Of course, people put, point to the role of Marshall Green, the Indonesian ambassador, the ambassador for coups. Marshall Green in 1961 was the senior American diplomat when a coup took place in South Korea, bringing a right-wing general, Park Chung-hee, to power. There was a pattern, as we know, and no one will deny the pattern of American involvement around the third world, of trying to bring to power uh, efficient right-wing generals who would be agents of modernization, according to the theories of civic mission being developed around the Rand Corporation guy, Park, Parker, and things like that. So Marshall Green was ambassador, who was the charge d'affaires in South Korea when there was a military coup. He was the ambassador in Jakarta when the coup took place. He came to Canberra in 1973 under the Whitlam government, <laughs> and some of us with knowledge about Indonesia said the Whitlam government may well fall to a sudden coup. And we were rebuked by right-thinking persons for fanciful flights of folly and uh, an indulgence in conspiracy theories. Well, we know that the Whitlam government didn't fall to a coup by 
a Governor General passed links to the CIA. Now, Marshall Green died in 1998, but his ghost has still been up to these things. His ghost was seen here in Canberra on Monday afternoon outside the Liberal Party meeting room. It paused for a while in front of Tony Abbott's door and then disappeared. Another one gone, another weak populist with a shonky economic agenda. He's pulling them down from the grave. Five minutes, thank you. And uh, I've got to say, it was a reliable identification of the ghost. It was no other than my co-panelist, Robert Cribb, who identified the ghost as that of Marshall Green. <laughs> I, in my last minutes, I've got to talk about Greg Poolgreen's investigations. He's sitting up the back here. His book, The Genesis of Confrontasi, 1998, suggested that, that it was the British who were really behind the coup, that they'd been deeply involved in the situation in the area, naturally, is with their project for decolonization in Malaysia. Who was Confrontasi against? It was against Malaysia and British plans to get rid of the uh, to, to decolonize and create Malaysia effectively. So it's argued that Harold Macmillan took the decision that Sukarno had to be unseated. It was carried out under uh, Harold Wilson. Uh, and in Greg Pulgrain's book, he suggests that the Brunei rebellion, which triggered confrontation, did not come from Azhari, but was actually organized by British intelligence. And so the coup against Sukarno was managed so that the British projects in the area and British economic interests in Sumatra could be safeguarded. Greg Pulgrains brought, just brought out another book, The Incubus of Intervention, Conflicting Indonesia Strategies of John F. Kennedy and Alan Dulles. And he suggests that it, it's very much tied up with the discovery of immensely rich gold deposits in West New Guinea in 1936, which were kept secret because the Dutch didn't want the Japanese to be even more interested in the archipelago than they were. But Alan Dulles and other uh, and shadowy economic interests found out about these gold deposits and were interested in getting in and getting access to them, as they did in the end. So it's in Greg Pulgrain's book that uh, Alan Dulles arranged the death of Doug Hammerschold. I was asking my distinguished colleagues how to pronounce it last night, and none of them could tell me so, except Vanessa told me it was a Vietnamese name, I think. Uh, but Doug Hammerschold's death in a plane crash and President Kennedy's death were caused, was caused because they had a plan to end confrontation, working together with Sukarno, and they were eliminated. Well, these, the pool grain investigations tend to bring laughs of incredulity to people and say the guy must be off his rocker. But it is based on very careful archival and uh, uh, interview material, and Greg is here, you know, hopefully will speak to these. His books have got strong sponsorship. Pramudia Anantatur wrote the introduction to the first one, and the forward to the second one was written by the successor to Pramudia Anantatur, Father Bascara, who will be speaking here uh, later in the afternoon. Very briefly, the other main theory is that China was behind it. And that is that the, China, the Chinese convinced Aydat, he certainly had meetings with Mao in Beijing uh, early in August, and it was the Chinese that injured the steps taken by the PKI uh, that led to the army, the junior officers, uh, joining, up, uh, the join, joining up with the PKI operatives and undertaking the kidnappings. So these are the main theories. I must stop here. And uh, I think what a large, each of these theories has its advocates. There are books and articles uh, backing each of these theories. I think the general view would be mostly now 
along the lines of John Roos's investigation, that there were discontented junior officers who had their own reasons to move against the disloyal generals, but they did somehow get caught up with Shum and Idit, though perhaps not other leaders of the PKI, a couple of conspiracies came together, that Sahato may well have been in on it, and it's hard to believe that it wasn't all planned without some sort of encouragement by overseas intelligence agencies. I hope it becomes clear during the course of the day. Thank you very much.